Corinthians chapter 4, most importantly, the Word of God. We've been, been kind of lighthearted over the past few moments, but um, uh, we want to turn to Scripture and get very serious. You know, my messages are always very serious, very few. Hey, Jackie, wave. Jackie, my sister right here is in the fourth row right there. The, wave again. Nobody saw you. Most of you know I have three older sisters, and my Jackie's a, um, a cheese head from Wisconsin, my sister Jackie. And, and so she's here. I just love my sisters. And just a couple rows back, Grandpa, uh, Louis Clifton, can you just wave? We got to, just wave. Go on right there. So you know um, uh, Megan's grandfather. We welcome you, Grandpa. Great to have you with us today. You've heard me tell stories about Louis Clifton, Megan's grandfather. I call him my grandfather, too, but pastored Calvary Assembly of God in Elkhart for eons. Was my pastor my whole life, and love him absolutely in, in uh, eons, long time. You know, let me tell you something about my past. Speaking of my past, I was addicted when I was a kid. I was. I was, I was addicted to speed. Um, uh, it, not necessarily LSD or PCP, MPH. Um, Miles per hour. I don't know why. And I, I got a feeling I got this from my dad, but he matured out of it too, I'm sure, but as I did, uh, sort of. Um, <laughs> now it just comes in spurts. You can ask my kids. The other day, I literally, I think I gave Tate whiplash. I feel so bad. I was like, watch how fast I can take this curve. Whew. And so I just turn it right here by the Essen House and turn it on the counter at 16. They were not impressed, <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> I, I was addicted to speed, though. From the age of 16 to 19, I had a major addiction, and um, uh, there, there's no classes for, hello, my name is Scott, I'm addicted to speed. No, no classes like that. There was a class, though, and <laughs> I did take part in that. <laughs> Defensive driving class. Um, I went through that with Elkhart County's finest, and um, uh, two Saturday mornings in a row. I actually had to go sit in a class. I understand now you can do it online. <laughs> online defensive driving. You don't have to sit through that. Um, it wasn't the most uh, fun class, but I remember going through that, and I remember there's another guy a couple years ahead of me. He probably doesn't even remember now, but Ben Hurst, Benji Hurst, and, and I remember just him and I were looking at each other thinking, what in the world are we doing here? We are smarter than this. I can't believe we actually are in, have to go to this class for two Saturdays in a row. Um, but, so I went through that, but I remember every time I got pulled over, which was a few times, but I haven't been pulled over since I was 19, if that helps. That was the last time. I started dating Megan about that time, and she tamed me. But, um, but I, every time, I, I can take you right now to the emotion of being pulled over. I can take you. You, me, you remember the time, last time you were pulled over? Maybe it was back when you were 19, but you, you, in the Model T. But you, you, you're sitting in, you're, I'm sitting, I was joking, I, sitting in that Grand Am I had a 1987 Pontiac Grand Am. I was so addicted to speed. My brother-in-law, Gary, is more like a brother to me. But uh, Gary and I were, were we, I took a stopwatch with me when I was test driving cars. I'm telling you, I was addicted to speed. <laughs> and I remember the Grand Am, I ended up getting, we, we took it from zero to 60 in a little over 10 seconds. I said, I can have this car. I, that was a deciding fact. I was addicted to speed. I, I was dumb. And, and I remember, I can take you to the emotion of every time I got pulled over as I'm sitting there, because every time I was guilty, I knew I was. Do you know why I pulled you over? Yes, sir. You were speeding. <laughs> yes, sir. And I mean, I can take the emotion, the heart wrenching. I'm upset with myself. You know, I had a radar detector only for just to know when there's emergencies and <laughs> stuff like that. It had nothing to do with wanting to speed. That's a lie. But... <clears throat> But, you know, I'd rip it down, hoping he didn't see it. You'd have a little more mercy on me. So, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, because you did it too. Scott Horner, I bet you you did, huh? Okay. I remember the emotion, but let me just get to my point. Never once did I turn, that, to, turn to that officer as I'm sitting in that grain and I look up and roll down the window because it didn't have power. I roll down the window, and I, I never once did I look at and say, you are so judgmental. Who are you to say that I'm a speeder, that I'm speeding? You police officers are so judgmental. Go around judging everyone just because someone breaks in and, and hurts somebody or just because someone steals the old lady's purse on the street and runs off. You're so judgmental. Jeez. Uh, sir, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, the law says <laughs> speed limit's 55 and you went over there. But you're so judgmental. 
Now, we all know that, of course, that'd be crazy for someone to look at that police officer and say, you're so judgmental. There's no way. Why? Because there's a little manual that I was given. It's probably digital now. I don't know. But I was given back when I was 15. I had to read through that and memorize. And I had to take a test on it. It said, if there's an octagon, it's a stop sign, right? <laughs> if, if it's like a, a rectangle and it's white and it says 55 mile per hour, it's a speed limit. Hello. I mean, that's the law. That's the rule, if you will. That's the guideline right there. That's what you're supposed to do. And he was just enforcing that. But here's, here's my thought. Have, has anyone ever, ever said that to you as a, being a Christian? You Christians are so judgmental. You're so judgmental. You're always going on judging this person, judging that person, judge, judge, judge. And don't you know Jesus said, judge not, lest ye be judged. And they, they toss them out. Now let me just say something from the very top. All of us at times have dealt with being a, a Pharisee, a Pharisees. I mean, all of us at times have been judgmental, and we, as followers of Christ, we need to work on that. But, but uh, I'm just thinking, even as we go to our text today, we're, we're, we're walking through 1 Corinthians. Turn there with me if you're not there yet. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. A couple weeks ago, last week, Jason did a great job of bringing a message um, from a later part in chapter 4. We're just hanging out in chapter 4 for a little while here. But two, three weeks ago or somewhere in there, I, I shared the, first, the first, uh, first two verses. Let's just as a reminder. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. So the Apostle Paul is saying us, pastors, uh, overseers, leaders of the church, people ought to, ought to see us as um, uh, servants. And just a reminder, this word servants was like, wasn't just what even you and I think. This was like the lowest of the low. And so, um, so just, okay, secrets of the Christ is those entrusted with secret things of God. Verse 2, now it's required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The greatest thing we can, we can do as pastors and leaders and overseers and even as followers of Christ is just stay faithful. Do you know, God hasn't called you to be happy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. I can have joy as I walk through the midst of pain. Am I right? It, I'm not saying it's easy. You know, yesterday was 23 years since my uh, parents went to be with Jesus. I think it was 23, something like that. I didn't think a whole lot of it until I got halfway through the parade, and I started seeing people that I knew that knew my parents. And I saw Lowell and Nancy Miller at their house. I think they lived there for, just for a long time on Main Street. And I saw, I saw some other people, and, I, and all of a sudden I had to, like, choke. I just had to stop singing and say, I will not cry. I will not cry right now. Just thinking about mom and dad. And, and I, I can tell you... Even 23 year, years later, it's still hard. Those of you who don't know, we lost our parents when I was, when I was 15. A drunk driver hit them. But I just want to testify to you, and I know saints all across this room, you can testify as I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, there still is a peace that underlies everything. There still is a rest in the Lord it doesn't make it any maybe easier as much as it just it keeps you going. We know that this world is not my home. This isn't where I'm going. One day, my, my parents love Jesus. I'm going to see them again. And for those who passed on before us, we have that joy. We have that peace. That even in the midst of the trial, there's joy. And I just, I, I don't know why as I was going over my notes, I just, I, I couldn't help but to go back to verse 2. God hasn't called you to be happy. He's called you to be faithful. He's called you to be obedient. And one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. There's a difference between joy and happiness. I've preached on it before, but I'm, I can't go into that. Okay, now, I promise, this isn't going to be a long message. I just got one, one thought. We're going to share it. But look at verse 3. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's heart. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Go back to verse 3. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Now, the Apostle Paul... <laughs> Remember the context of this. The Corinthian church was thrown around. Well, I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Cephas. Well, I follow Paul. Well, I follow... They, they were rating all... They were judging, if you will, the different preachers, the different pastors, the different expositors of the word. And why well, I like this one. Why well, I like this one. 
They were also arguing about human philosophy. Well, I think my philosopher is better than yours. Well, I think this philosophy is smarter than your philosophy. And, and they're arguing about all these things. You read the first couple books of the first Corinthians and you'll see that. So they're judging, they're arguing. And the Apostle Paul in verse 3 says, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by human court. I don't even judge myself. I don't think the Apostle Paul was thinking, man, I don't give a rip what you think. I don't think that's what he was saying. I think he's saying, what I do in the ministry, I'm not doing it for the applause of men. The human side wants to hear congratulations. The human side is, boy, pastor, you're doing a great job. Boy, pastor. But the fact of the matter is, when I stand before men, that's not important. When I stand before God, when a pastor, this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, when a pastor stands before God, they want to be able to say, well done. And he says, well done, good and faithful servant. They want to, I, I want to be able to stand before God and say, Scott, I know that was difficult. I know that was hard, but you made the right call. Thank you for following me and not man. And sometimes, as any leader knows in any capacity, it's hard. Because there's this little thing that we like, we kind of like to be liked. <laughs> Hey, here in the church or outside, wherever you're, you like to be like, but sometimes the hard decision is, is the right decision. And, and so you just got to be faithful. Okay, so the, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, whether you think I'm the best or not, whether you think I'm good, hey, I don't even, that's not even important. In fact, I don't, further on, I don't even judge myself because who am I to judge myself as much as I'm going to wait for God? Let God be the judge. Because man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And, and so uh, the Apostle Paul's making this point. Now, understand that point. Grasp that point. Now, I just want to jump out on that thought just for a second. Here's my question. Ready? Is there ever a time to judge? Now, I don't have any fill in the blanks in your notes today, but I want to encourage you. As I go from passage to passage, let me just jot down your thoughts, and we're going to come back around to this, but is there ever a time to judge? After all, in telling the Corinthians not to judge, wasn't the Apostle Paul judging them for trying to judge him and others? Mm. Well, Apostle Paul, who are you to judge? What's the foundation you have? What, how, who do you think you are? Judge, you're judging us because you're saying that we're judging you and judging others. I think we're all judging. Who are you to say? And uh, Is there ever a right time to judge? Let's keep going with that thought. We love Chicago. I like the Chicago Bears. I like the Chicago Cubs. I'm sorry. You're okay. <coughs> Sorry for some of you who maybe are sucked into Detroit. I don't know. Uh, perhaps into um, uh, the Packers. I don't know why. <laughs> but hey, whoever it is, the fact of the matter, we enjoy Chicago. And every once in a while, our family goes to Chicago for the day. And we like window shopping because most everything on Michigan Avenue is too expensive. <laughs> but there are a few stores you can grab some stuff in. And, and of course, you get the caramel corn from Garrett's and all that kind of stuff. But hey, okay, let's di digress. But we like walking up and down Michigan Avenue. I remember it was a, a year or two ago, we were in Chicago. And me, the girls, of three daughters, and my wife Megan, and we're walking. And it's about 8.30, and the sun's starting to go down. It's starting to get dark. And all of a sudden, I just had this sense. You know, just all of a sudden, I just saw that the volume around us just started to kind of rise. And I looked, and sure enough, there's about 20 or 30 teenagers just, I mean, they got their swagger on. They're just, I, I'm, I'm talking white, black. It, it wasn't a racial thing, but I'm just telling you, they, they were just starting to surround us. And this was as a, at about the time, you might remember a year or two ago, when, when kids started just get on Facebook and other things, hey, join me at the CVS. If there's 30 of us, they can't catch us all. We'll go in and tear it all up. And then I don't know if you remember seeing any of that on the news back then. And I guess it may still be happening. But, and here's these kids on Michigan Avenue, and they're, they're just kind of loud. And, and here we are right in the middle of them pushing the stroller. <laughs> you want to say I judged? I judged. <laughs> I judged immediately. I was like, this is not a good place. I'm not even sure our kids picked up on it. They might not, not even know. But I, guys, let's cross the street. And so without any fanfare or whatever, we, we got to the next thing, and, and everyone's kind of stopped with us. But we crossed the street, and they kind of kept going on. And no sooner did we cross the street, but police officers came out of nowhere. And zoom, zoom. They're going in the middle lane, and they're going to the next block. And then another one goes to the next block. And they are following these kids. And I have no idea what happened with those kids. I have no idea. What, all I can say is this. I'll, I'll, be, I'll shoot straight with you. I judged every one of those. I judged the situation. If you want to call it judging, I judged it. I, I did. I, 
Was that right of me? Was that? Is there ever a good time to judge? Is it ever right to judge? I think about um, John chapter 8. You don't have to turn there, but I will. John chapter 8, there's a, um, uh, there's a woman who, who was caught in adultery. And it goes something like this. Um, uh, Jesus, uh, they, the Pharisees brought this, this gal, uh, verse 4, and Jesus said to, teach, to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Verse 6, they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down, started to write on the ground with his finger. And when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to, uh, to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up, asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Go, go and sin no more. What a powerful story. I mean, I could build a series just on that, and I've thought about building a series just on that. What? There is so much we can learn from that. Jesus bent over. Now, what was he writing in the sand and the dirt? Nobody knows. Every preacher guesses. <laughs> and we like to think we're right. I just kind of think it had something to do with name and sins. And as, as, those, as those guys were looking at it, and they were just being good Pharisees, following the law. This is what they were supposed to do. But they're writing just, okay, this and this. And Jesus is writing out different sins. And those guys are, and it says the older ones saw, for, the older ones backed off first, it says. And they started peeling off, the older Pharisees, until nobody else was there. And it's just them and Jesus. And, and you know, we, in this story, again, so much I can say, but we, we always pick on the Pharisees, and maybe rightfully so. I think, granted, hear me, we, we need to be careful about judging and understand that, yeah, um, we, we, need, we need to be careful. But, but the thing that dawned on me in this story was, what about Jesus? You know what some people would say about Jesus is that he judged the Pharisees. I want you just to follow my train of thought. I'm going to land in just a second, but keep following me. Didn't Jesus judge the Pharisees? Who's Jesus to judge the Pharisees? Oh, Jesus, you're judging people. Was he judging? Was he judging? Them? He was judging the Pharisees. He knew their hearts. He knew what was going on. Wasn't Jesus judging? I thought Jesus was the one that said, judge not lest you be judged. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, he was. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, do not judge or, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye? Pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye. And then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talking. Was... Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus was teaching pretty straightforward there. I'm sure he knew the hearts of those people, and he knew that some of those people were struggling with this whole pharisaical attitude. They thought they were better than everyone else, and Jesus was like, hey, listen, before you take, uh, before you, you talk about the speck and that person, take the log out of your eye. Listen, deal with your own sin, and this is some great stuff, but hold on here. Jesus, you're telling us not to judge, but I think you're being kind of judgmental too. Jesus, after all, don't you know the Scripture says, judge not lest you do. Oh, you're the one that said that? Okay. <clears throat> it, it, is there ever a time to judge? First John. We're going we're gonna to end right here. First John. If, if you can, go there. It's, if you go to the last book of the Bible, it's Revelation. A couple of books before that um, is First John. First John chapter 4. We're, we're just going to go there because I think there's some real wisdom we can find here. I think the, the answer to this question it's found in this passage. Look at verse 2. In fact, I'm going to start in verse 1. First John, this isn't the gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is um, the, one of the letters of John later on, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, right before Revelation. 1st John chapter 4, verse 1 says this, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're... Test the... Test? Test? Judge? I thought we weren't supposed to judge! Judge! Do it. Test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. This is what I want you to get. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God, if God's in this or not. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. 
This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Okay, is it judging? Are, are, is there ever a time to judge? This is what I think the bottom line is. Whether you want to call it judgment, I would, I would, I would use this word, discern. Discernment. I, I, I just tell you what's in my heart, and I, I, I've gone over this message all week. I, I even went to Megan. I was like, Megan, help me just, what are your thoughts? Help me process it, because what's in my heart, what the Lord's put in my heart, I just feel like I'm not doing a very good job. I, in my notes, even, I, I'm not doing a very good job of helping you see, but this is, sometimes people who aren't following Christ, they look at Christians as, as, as judgmental people. They are so judgmental. And I'm going to say it again. Sometimes they're right. And it is frustrating that we're, at times we're known more about uh, for what we're against than what we're for, right? But there's still, there's, you know, um, uh, love mercy, act justly, walk humbly. There's mercy and there's justice. There's both. It's not just, let's just all be grace. There's judgment too. So there's got to be a balance. And so that's my call to you, church, is let's be balanced. But let's not, students especially, hear me, let's not fall into this trap of, well, I just, I don't want to be judgmental, and I'm trying not to judge. I don't want to judge. I understand what you're saying. But somewhere along the line, we've got to understand there is truth. There is something that we line everything up to. There is a, 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 a line that says, this is truth, this is right, and if you want to call me judgmental, okay, but the fact of the matter is, I'm a follower of Jesus. And so as this passage says in verse 2, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. Here's my thought to you. If you get one thing out of this message, get this. What do they do with Jesus and the Word of God? That's it. What do they do with Jesus and the Word of God? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Well, the Apostle Paul, who are you to judge us? They didn't say that, but I'm just thinking they could have. Hey, listen here, bub. You're calling our philosophies man's wisdom. You're, we're, we, I kind of like that Apollos guy, and I can't believe you're yelling at me for liking Apollos. That wasn't... He, you're judging. No, no, no. What he was saying is, here's what Scripture has to say about that. Here's what Jesus would say if he were alive, and here's what the Word of God has to say about that. That's the, the groundwork. And, and, and he was taking that and lining that up with their lives, and that's why we have the whole letter of 1 Corinthians. It's because there was a truth. There was a starting point. In John chapter 8, the woman who uh, committed adultery. Now, we can, out, um, we can write it out of our government. We, we, can, we can decide that um, there are certain portions of Scripture that our government is going to go ahead and say, yes, you can do this, even if they're, but it still doesn't make it right. I mean, uh, I, I just... I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I want to make sure you get that. Our starting point is not what the Constitution even says, though I think we're blessed as a nation overall to have a, a, a Constitution that, that helps fulfill what we're trying to do. But the fact of the matter is it doesn't matter if they ever change the Constitution about the definition of a marriage or the definition of whatever, and it goes against the Word of God, the Word of God still trumps it. And, and if someone wants to call us judgmental, then so be it. Listen, you won't be the first one that was hated. Jesus was hated. In fact, in, um, uh, go to that scripture, can you? It, it's all the way in John chapter 15, verse 18. Check this out. I just, uh, man, this just so burned in my heart this week. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. If the world hates you for standing up for righteousness, if the world hates you for doing the right thing, doing the Bible thing, Jesus in John chapter 8, what was the basis that he was pre teach, talk, talking to the Pharisees, writing in the dirt? What was, it was his word. It was his life. That was the basis. What said gave him the permission to discern or judge them? It was the word of God. And in uh, Matthew chapter, um, uh, chapter 7, 
the whole passage of judge not lest she be judged. Jesus obviously knew the crowd he was speaking to and was dealing with the major sin of comparison and judging. He knew human nature. And Jesus lined up what he knew to be true about these people's lives and then lined it up with the word. And that's why he taught them. You see, there is a thought, and it's a worldly thought. And I want to declare that. Uh, it's a no-brainer, but I want to make sure you understand it. It's a worldly thought of judge not lest you. Who are you to judge? Who are you to Listen, I'm not the one judging. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4 says this, For the word of God is living and active. It's in your notes or it's on the screen. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates and dividing soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. This is what I want you to get. It does what? It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Let's make sure that we're not so politically correct. I think there's some that we can do, but let's make sure we're not so politically correct that we wipe the truth of the gospel, the truth of scripture right out of our, our government, right out of our community. Let's, let's just look past Washington, D.C., whatever. Let's just bring this home to Elkhart County, to St. Joe, or to, to Steuben, or, or LaGrange, whatever county you live in. Let's just bring it home here, and let's make sure I was just a little stirred up as I was looking over the school calendar for Middlebury Schools this year, and I think it was the online version or something, I don't even remember. But I, okay, maybe this is wrong, I'm gonna, I know this is going to go out on the internet, but listen, I couldn't believe that um, uh, the Muslim holidays were on our school calendar. That was the first time I've seen that, here in Middlebury, Indiana. Now, now I, I, I have mixed feelings about that, but I, I just tell you, we've got some more work to do. We got some more work to do right here in this community of being the light. And if it, I, I don't think we need a green light to be dipsticks for Jesus. Okay? <laughs> Have you ever met a dipstick for Jesus? I, now I understand I say that late, but I, I've seen some people who blatantly put stuff. Uh, it, if you're from this community, you may even know who I'm going to talk about. I don't even know this person, but there's people that they, they you're going to hell. They're standing on the go. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. And they do that in a lot of different ways in this community. And I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's not a place for street preachers or those something, but let's make sure that as, as clear as our declaration of you're going to hell, let's make sure even more so maybe we tell them Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. He died for you on the cross. He made a way for you so you don't have to go to hell. You understand what I'm saying? And I, uh, this is what I'm saying, though. I want you to get this. There's going to come a time. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that through this generation and through our generation and through however more, many more li uh, years I have on this earth and you do too, that somehow we can change something in this great country. I hope I'm wrong. But I just felt it so strong in my heart today. And this week as I studied, that there may very well come a time where, where you, you, it might be illegal in our country to declare, thus saith the Lord. This is what God's word says. You and I might be thrown in, into jail. It might come to, um, uh, <clears throat> to a, a lot of different ways. You, you can just throw out whatever thoughts are already out there. I mean, you just think about the homosexual thing. Listen, if you struggle with the sin of homosexuality, there is, there is freedom in Jesus. Listen, there are, there's people that I've known that have committed other sexual sins. They've committed adultery. They've had relationships with people that aren't, they aren't married to. Listen, Jesus can forgive and, and, and give you freedom from that. And that's exactly what homosexuality is. It's not the, um, the worst of, uh, of all sins. There, I, I'm not quite sure there's different levels of sin. I think there's different bondages of sin. And I think that, that some people that are caught up in this sin or that sin, it, it can have a stronger hold on you. And it just takes a little more prayer and fasting to really be set free. And in my experience, uh, that sin of homosexuality, which I, well, who are you to judge? I'm not judging. The Word of God plainly says that homosexuality is sin. But, so it doesn't matter. There may come a time when for us to place this message online like we do every week and for me to say what I just said is going to be illegal. So we're going to have to decide, are we going to say it or not? There's going to come, there may come a time in our country and in your lifetime, I'm pretty sure, in my lifetime probably, 
where for us to say that Jesus Christ is the only way to get to God and get to heaven will become illegal. It may happen. I don't know. The fact of the matter is we have to decide. When everyone is standing in our face, why are you judging? You Christians are so judgmental. You're always judging. You're always judging. And at some point, we just we got to say, listen, if you want to think I'm judging, okay, all I know is the Word of God says, and this is my starting point. It's not what I feel most comfortable with. It's, it's, it's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's, it has nothing to do with me, me, me. It's all the Word of God. John 15, 18. If, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. Let me, let me just tell you, if you've never had somebody tell you, <clears throat> if you've never had someone tell you that you're judgmental, Maybe, maybe you need to check your faith a little bit. <laughs> I'm not saying like in a, again, like in a dipstick way, but <laughs> listen, one of my biggest regrets of high school, I, I've been talking a lot about high school with um, you know, my kids, and, and what I loved high school. I had, I had a great experience in high school. But one of my biggest regrets, students, if I could say anything to you, don't just be a good Christian kid. Be a... a be full, but don't, I, I, I had this pharisaical attitude when I was in high school, and some people would look at me and say, oh, Scott, I didn't think you did, whatever. There's no doubt in my mind, almost everybody I went to high school with, if they knew me, they knew what I stood for. There was no doubt about that. But there were times when I was a knucklehead for Jesus, and I, I regret that. Don't, don't just be, a, the, don't, don't just be the, the, the good little uh, goody two-shoe kid, which I naturally just kind of went to. Stand strong for your faith. Stand strong for what's right. Know what you believe and why you believe it. That's why you've got parents that are following Christ. And if you don't, that's why we even have a, a student ministries pastor and his wife sitting right in the front row. That's why they're there in your, your life group to help you affirm your faith. But, but understand, it's not about you, um, as they used to say, um, I, don't, uh, 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 what was it? I don't drink or chew or one with uh, girls that do or something. <laughs> It's not just about being a good kid. It's about living out your faith. You're going to mess up sometime in the four years of your high school years. You're going to mess up. You're going to do something stupid. It may negatively affect your, your, um, uh, your testimony. You know what you do? You just get right back on and say, you're right. I messed up. Admit it. Don't try to just admit it. I did it. And, I've, and move forward. Let them see that you're not as perfect as what maybe you think kind of hoped you were and you're not Jesus Christ but you are the representation of Jesus Christ wherever you go <sighs> let's just understand there may come a day there may come a day when this world is going to start hating us more and more and more and if they do that's where the rubber meets the road in your faith it was uh, it was a couple years ago we were uh, it's a second trip to Mission of Hope in Haiti of all places we're in Haiti what I'm getting ready to share with you, I don't think I've shared with anyone else but my wife. <clears throat> it was our second trip to Haiti. And um, I was standing up on top of the dorm house where we were at. I spent a lot of time in prayer when I'm in Haiti up on that roof. It's just something about just looking over, just the desolateness, the, the ocean, and just taking all this in. And I was praying. And uh, there's several reasons why, but let me just tell you what the Holy Spirit began to do in me. I, I journaled it. I wrote it down. I just started getting such a burden for our country. Such a burden for the United States. You know, this week I, I heard a story about a, a missionary. I think it was to Turkey. I don't remember where. But literally, he, in essence, he gave up his life to help reach some Muslims with the gospel. That's, a, that's the short story. And I was like, holy cow. Give me, and I, I'll be honest with you, on that day in Haiti, Listen, I'm not declaring my death at all. Hear me. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm going to be a martyr for Jesus in the United States, but I'm telling you, I, I hear missionaries come through, and they're so burdened for the Muslim nations. They're so burdened for the Asian uh, people. They're so burdened for the continent of Africa, and they can't wait to get back there. And, they, and I, you know, my heart is with them. Go. I, we'll help you go. As strong as any missionary gets up here and declares that, that's what I feel about my country, the United States of America. And I just, I just laid that out before the Lord. I said, Lord, how can we make a greater difference? I have no answers other than just keep 
living it out here. And, 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 and understand, even if it gets ugly, even if it ever reaches a point where we in the United States of America, one nation under God, if we turn our hand against God and we say, you can't say that, you can't do that, yeah, let's make sure that there's at least one church here in Middlebury, Indiana that says, we don't care. We, we're going we're gonna to be bold. We're going to stand up for our faith and what we know to be true. It's really easy to say that right now. <clears throat> but in the years to come, again, I pray I'm wrong, but in the years to come, if we are persecuted for our faith, and it could mean jail for you or for me, which is already happening all across the world. It's already happening, folks. There are already countries where you can't, and there are people that have been in prison just for naming the name of Jesus. If that ever happens in this country, let's make sure that we're, we're our what we will die for is right here. It's not so much Republican or Democrat or Libertarian or whatever. Um, we will die for this. We will, we, will, we, will, we will live for this as well. Amen? Whew. I don't know how well I did, but that's what was on my heart. Let's pray. Worship team, would you come? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word <clears throat> that just so clearly declares to us truth and God I just I want to pray for every person here today that sometimes we do struggle God I want to pray for the person who um, does struggle I think all of us at some points we can be a little pharisaical we can hold to uh, maybe man's rules or laws or or even, even be real judgmental uh, and look at other people and say, well, they're not as Christian as I am or they're not as holy as I am or they're not committed to Christ as I am. And, and God, we want to join the Apostle Paul in a sense and just say, listen, I'm not, I don't care if you judge me or I don't even judge myself because ultimately, uh, like our, our text says, God is going to judge and everything is going to be laid bare before God. And so, God, I just, man, I just ask right now, would you come and just convict every one of our hearts? If that's something that we're struggling with, in our community especially, we're struggling with, God, that, that we could just um, uh, be set free from that. And, Lord, I, I want to pray for this church, though. And I pray that you would help us to understand that there is a discernment that we have to be a part of. There is a discerning of spirits. There is a discerning, just like walking in Chicago. I, I was just enjoying the day. But there's something I discerned immediately that we needed to do something about. And God, that we would not, in the, in, in the attempt to be politically correct, that we would not back off from what we know to be truth. Even if that means somebody in our class at school looks us in the face and embarrasses us and says, you're so judgmental. Even if it's somebody at work, maybe even someone else who is, they claim Jesus Christ, but they're just, well, I don't want to judge. I don't want to judge. Well, the fact of the matter is your word already judges the thoughts of, of a heart. It's already there. And so, God, help us always to be committed to just bringing it back to Scripture, bringing it back to Scripture. And, God, I just, uh, we just take a moment right now just to lift up our country, Lord. God, I just, we just pray right now, God, would you just uh, move in our country? Help us to be um, committed. Help us, Lord, to be committed to doing everything we can to living out our faith. Christianity isn't about just the weekly gathering. That's a part of it. Christianity is about living our faith outside of the church. And so, God, I just ask right now that you just, um, God, baptize us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Your word says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit's come on you, and you're going to be my witnesses. God, I pray all over this house, even right now, as we pray, would you baptize us afresh with your Holy Spirit? Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Baptize us today, God. Empower us. And those of us who are already walking in that fullness, God, I pray that we would just live it. God, touch me. Help us to use the boldness that you've already given us, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We need you, God. Mm, Jesus.